Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Husey, and I'm Director of Strategic Deterrent Relation, uh, Studies here at the Mitchell Institute. And I want to welcome you to our Nuclear Deterrent and Missile Defense Forum series. We're very pleased today to have Dr. Uh, Dr. Uzi Rubin, who will be able to join us today from Israel. He's a renowned engineer and analyst, and he is an expert on missile defense and particularly on missile threats in the Middle East. He previously served as the director of the Israeli Missile Defense Organization in the Israel Ministry of Defense, where he was responsible for developing Israel's first national defense shield, or the Arrow. Welcome, Dr. Rubin, and thank you for taking the time to join us today as you have previously. I'd like to start off by giving you an opportunity to make some opening remarks in your uh, briefings, which are always wonderful to watch. And as a note to our audience, feel free to raise your hand using the function on the app or submit a question in the Q&A window during any time during the discussion. And we'll get to those questions in the second half of the hour. So over to you, Dr. Rubin. And again, thank you for coming here and joining us all the way from Israel. Thank you, Peter. It's a joy. And they say, as they say, next year in Washington, uh, due to uh, the situation and the situation of international travel, um, I'm doing it here from Tel Aviv. Um, and I hope that by next year, the situation will be much better and we'll be able to meet uh, face to face in uh, yes. uh, in Washington, in beautiful Washington Republican Club. Uh, here is my slideshow. Uh, let me just take this away. And I'll be speaking about today, about uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh war. Do you see the whole slide? Because I don't see the... Yes, the, we see it easy. Yeah. Uh, I'll speak about the war in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which uh, took place about uh, seven months ago. And um, it, it was a short conflict, but very illuminating because it revealed the face of a future battlefield to some extent. So I'll, talk about, I'll, I'll speak about the history of Armenia and Azeri conflict, which is very unknown in the Western world. Uh, the military build up the, the two nations before the war, in the order of battle. And then I'll overview the military campaign. There was a ground campaign. There was a, some missile campaign. And mainly there was an air campaign. There was no uh, maritime campaign because uh, there is no sea there in the battle area. The Caspian Sea is far away and no naval battle, no, no naval battle took place. I'll speak about the outcome and the lessons, and then I'll expand it to the lessons to Israel and speak shortly about the recent uh, flare-up uh, that we had with the uh, Gaza Palestinians, on which I have a much more detailed presentation, um, not in English yet, but I'm preparing in English, many, many details, and uh, uh, Peter said that uh, he'll invite me one day to uh, give you that presentation. So I'll just give you the highlights of it and how the lessons from that Nagorno-Karabakh uh, war uh, were studied and uh, acted upon by our uh, own military. So uh, here's a map of the area. You see the theater, the, uh, the, the, the state of Azerbaijan, and the state of Armenia. And then here you see something which is called Nagorno-Karabakh, which is an area legally belonging to Azerbaijan, but populated mostly by Armenians. It's a controversial situation of a, um, as national minority uh, really wanting very much to unite with the majority, but uh, international circumstances don't allow it. Uh, if I compare the two countries, you see that uh, Azerbaijan really outsizes uh, Armenia. I mean, nominal Armenia. The area is uh, square kilometers about uh, almost three times, population almost three times bigger. The GDP, Armenia is a poor country. It has uh, no natural resources to speak of, some copper, some gold. And uh, Azerbaijan is one of the giants of the gas industry. They have uh, discovered a lot of oil and gas in the Caspian Sea. In fact, are now providers, if you see the gas lines coming from the Caspian Sea from Azerbaijan, the most important one is the southern route, which I don't show the whole length of it, but it goes all the way to Europe. So uh, it's strategically uh, important. Uh, its terminal is in Italy, in Bari, I think, in Italy. Uh, that made, uh, makes uh, Azerbaijan an uh, international player in the 
an energy market. Uh, defense expenditure, naturally, it's a smaller country. They spend more on defense proportionally to their GDP. The main energy here is interesting. We, we see a kind of confront rivalry here between Russia and Turkey over areas of influence. Uh, the main ally of Armenia is Russia. Turkey, if you remember, uh, historically, Ottoman Turkey was an uh, enemy of the Armenians, and you all remember the Armenian genocide, now recognized uh, by the United States. Uh, there is no love lost between uh, the Armenians and the Turks. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Turkey is the uh, main sponsor of uh, Azerbaijan. The political system in Armenia now is parliamentary and the, the parliamentary democracy, uh, while in Azerbaijan is presidential, authoritarian. And just to uh, illustrate the point, here is a picture of uh, Armenia, of Azerbaijan president, uh, Ilham Ilayev. He inherited the job from his father. His father, uh, Ilayev Sr., was a general in the Soviet uh, army. And the Soviet Union fell, he, he was an Azeri. He ran back to uh, uh, Baku and uh, eventually became the president. And then he died. And what, what's more, what comes more naturally than his son becomes uh, the president. And also he has a vice president that you see, he's, he's the vice president of his side. And they're holding hands because she's also his wife. And a very, very attractive lady. Uh, she's an eye doctor and a personality by herself. Well, the Azeris seem to be happy with the situation, so who, who am I to complain? But, but you can see the setup now. Az Azerbaijan is a very friendly country to Israel, so I, I have less to complain even then. And here is a third in, uh, political structure, which uh, is in between, which is called uh, Republic of Archach. Actually, it's uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, a larger Nagorno-Karabakh with very small population of about 150,000, it's a large area. It's about uh, one quarter of the area of Azerbaijan. And it was created after a series of wars between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So let's go over the history of the conflict. After the, uh, the imperial uh, Tsarist regime fell in the revolutions, the two revolutions of Russia at the end of the last part of the First World War, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, which was a part of uh, Russia, the Russian Empire, uh, declared independence. And immediately a war started, a revolt started by the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. And it, it, it turned into almost a full-scale conflict between the two countries, except that by 1920, Lenin sent a newly created uh, Red Army down south to take Baku. So they imposed their will, and uh, Azerbaijan and... Uh, Armenia became Soviet, willfully, of course, out of own free will, became Soviet republics. For a while, uh, Lenin uh, played with the idea of giving Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. But then the Armenians had a revolt or something, so as a punishment, uh, he took it away and included it in uh, Azerbaijan. So, so it went during the Soviet Union era, but when the Soviet Union started weakening in 1988, two, two years before it fell, three years before it fell, a civil war started between the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenian and the Azeris, and that escalated after the fall of the Soviet Union into a full-scale war between independent Armenia and independent Azerbaijan. And at that time, Armenia won the war. Uh, it actually managed to occupy all this area, Nagorno-Karabakh plus area around them. And the uh, Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh declared themselves as a Republic of Archach which is a name hailed back to ancient time when Armenia was a major player in the area, a much bigger, uh, much bigger country. Actually, what they did, they took over all these areas, which were populated by Azeris, Muslim Azeris, and vacated them, what we call ethnic cleansing. And um, that was a situation which became stable until uh, 2010, when a series of uh, growingly violent escalation cycles that we know them here from our situation here in the Middle East, uh, started becoming more and more violent uh, along the 1988 ceasefire line. The last and the biggest was in July 2020, about exactly one year ago, almost exactly one year ago, which was, as we understand now, a run-up to the full-scale war. The Azeris were planning a full-scale war to recover their lost area, 
uh, of Archach, or Nagorno Karabakh and Archach. And uh, the last uh, flare up that was a general rehearsal was a four days, full scale, four days war in July 2020. Now let's talk about uh, foreign relations alliance, it's very important uh, in winning or losing wars. Azerbaijan has very strong affiliation with Turkey. The Azerbaijanis consider themselves as Turks. The language, Azeri, is very similar to Turkish language. Uh, they see themselves hailing from the same Turkish uh, tribes that um, moved west in the Middle Ages. In fact, they call themselves two countries, one nation. There is strong military support by Turkey's armed forces since 1991, since the end of the Soviet Union, but there is no formal alliance. There is, there is a whole cordial relation with Russia, but somewhat cooler relation with Iran. Now it's very interesting that Iran is made up, part of the population of Iran is made of Azeris, which are concentrated in the west, in the north, northwest of uh, Iran. And some Azeris see this area as the lost area of Azerbaijan. So there is some, some kind of a bad feeling, although they have cordial political relations. Also, Iran uh, usually supports Armenia, and whenever they have an international uh, confrontations, Iran's usual support support usually goes to Armenia. So the relations are not very good, and the Azeris has very good relations with us. So it, you can you can see the situation. Armenia is a member of the Common Security Treaty Organization, which is the Russian NATO. And it hosts two bases of uh, on uh, Russian bases on Armenian territory, much to the north, uh, towards the Caucasus, the Caucasus mountain. In 2018, there was a Velvet Revolution. There was an authoritarian president of the Ukrainian style. He was deposed by a journalist called Pashanyan. And it was a Velvet Revolution. It was like bloodless. And Pashanyan started courting the EU, asking for support. He didn't get much because there is no international legitimacy to the Armenian's case in the Gorno Karabakh. It's considered part of, by all international, uh, uh, international law and treaties, it's considered a legitimate part of Azerbaijan. So, as Archach and the Gorno Karabakh case had no support in the West, no support in the United States, no support anywhere. In fact, uh, Archach is not recognized by any international body or any government, including, it's not recognized even by the Armenian's government itself. So it's kind of an orphan political uh, structure there. And uh, when the, you don't have legitimacy in your case, usually it doesn't help you in war. Many people even in Israel have to remember this. Uh, the military buildup between the wars, Armenia is too poor and not sufficient uh, uh, resources to modernize its ground forces and air defense forces, still mostly equipped with Soviet uh, era systems. You'll see in the videos later on some old stuff uh, that we remember from Syria. That limited uh, modernization of their manned air force through acquisition of four Sukhoi 30 SM. That's a generation, four pl plus generation, four and a half generation fighter aircraft, equivalent to the latest version of uh, the F 15. Let me hurry and say here that those aircraft didn't take part in the war. The reason for that, you know, they remained grounded. Uh, on the other hand, Azerbaijan used uh, very astutely its oil income to do a considerable modernization of its ground forces. And then very smartly, it didn't invest in manned air force. They didn't buy new fighter aircraft. They still used the old MiG-29s from the Soviet era. What they did, uh, a significant buildup of fleet of un unmanned air vehicles, UAVs, since 2007, mostly from Israel. And, and some, they got uh, permission, license for uh, local production, and they produced them. In July 2020, that means uh, three months before the war, four months before the war, they acquired all of a sudden a new UAV, which is different from the Israel UAVs in one key respect. This is an armed UAV. Israel doesn't sell uh, armed UAVs. You can buy Israeli UAVs for, uh, uh, for surveillance, for reconnaissance, for intelligence, but not armed with uh, weapons of uh, 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 offensive weapons. Why is that? I don't know. That's an Israeli policy. 
for a long time, but the Turks, they have a new product made by a young uh, MIT graduate called uh, Seljuk, Seljuk by Raktar. Uh, it's a fascinating story by itself. And he came up with this very handsome looking uh, UAV, which carries four air to ground gliding bombs. Uh, it's a very capable one, uh, also low, it's quite stealthy, low uh, radar cross section. Uh, shortly before the war started, the Turks uh, uh, deployed four F-16s to Azerbaijan, to Baku, probably to counterbalance the four uh, uh, Su-30s that uh, Armenians had. Uh, so if you look at the order of battle on the eve of the war and compare uh, what each side had, you see again that Azerbaijan is uh, strong, bigger, can deploy bigger forces, bigger ground force. You look at the number of troops. It's almost twice the ground troops, Armenia and Archach. Archach had its own separate army, but it was actually populated by many uh, Armenian uh, recruits. Um, and still, they, uh, Azerbaijan is twice as many. The reserves, it's not uh, such a great majority, but reserves are more or less equal, but still they outnumber them. Main battle tanks, about 50% more main battle tanks. Ground attack aircraft here, the Armenians had a little more, but those are ancient ground attack aircraft, the Sukhoi 29 fog foot, uh, fighter of Soviet aircraft, the MiG-29 vintage from the 80s. Uh, they had a few more. Modern uh, aircraft, modern fighter aircraft, Azerbaijan did, didn't invest in it. The Armenia invested in four of them, paid a lot of money for that, to apparently no effect. Again, there is a mystery why no effect. Um, UAVs for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. This 46 that they bought from Israel, of all, bought, of Israel all manufactured are licensed. While Armenia uh, had about uh, 20 uh, reconnaissance UAVs, partly uh, bought from Russia, and partly made, they, they started their own military industry. They had a couple of types of their own, but in small numbers. Armed UAVs, that's a Bayraktar, which I said, there is no official information how many the uh, Azerbaijanis bought. The number here is my own uh, personal guess of about 20, but that goes all together with the, there's a whole system. I'm talking just about the aircraft, but there's a whole system behind it with the control panel and communication. How many of those uh, control centers they bought, I don't know. Armenia and Russia had nothing like that, nothing compared to that. The suicide UAV, I'll explain that concept later, uh, which turned out to be a crucial uh, weapon of that war. The Azerbaijanis had probably hundreds. I wrote here dozens with a question mark, probably hundreds, while the Armenians had uh, none. Now, let's, like, let's, before we start uh, looking at the war itself, we have to look at the arena, we have to look at the, the geography. So the geography is very mountainous. Armenia is a mountainous country, this is Caucasus mountain. Uh, Archach and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh are in a very uh, mountainous area. Uh, here is uh, Lelachin Pass, is the only uh, comfortable road, decent road that goes between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. And if you close that road, uh, actually you disconnect uh, the Gono Karabakh from Armenia. You cannot uh, supply. Uh, there is the city of Stepenkert, which is the um, capital city of, uh, as, as, of the Gono Karabakh, with Ashtrach. And the other city nearby, within spitting distance, is uh, Shusha, which used to be the main Azeri city before the war of, uh, um, of separation in the end of the Soviet era, it was largely uh, abandoned by the uh, Azeri population and uh, was half vacated. Uh, this is a mountainous area, very hard to fight in here, it's very hard, but there is a river here called the Araz River, which goes eventually to the Black, to the Caspian Sea. And along that river, there is a valley, and this is a classical, invasion route of anyone who wants to invade uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and, and afterwards Armenia. So that's where the ground fighting started. 
The war started on October 3rd with a ground assault along the, uh, the southern border here, as you see, along the river, along the river, and with some attacks in the north. It didn't go well for a week. It was a static warfare, and the feeling started going that the Azeris blew it, and the Armenians fought very well, very bravely, very well, and uh, they managed to hold them for a week. Then the Azeris uh, turned the forces, reinforced the forces in the south from the troops in the north, and started grinding their way, village by village, along three long weeks, until they managed to occupy all this side of the river, uh, south of Nagorno-Karabakh, and started moving into the mountain towards the Lachin Pass. In the last week of the war, they sent the special troops up the mountains, in a very daring operation and managed to occupy Shusha, the town of Shusha, which for the Azeris was something symbolically very uh, emotional. They celebrated that in Baku uh, with fireworks and, and there was the occupation of Shusha, it's like liberation of Jerusalem or something. So uh, after six weeks at that point, when they were in Shusha, which as I say, is a sp spitting distance from the Steppenkirk, which is a capital city, and the forces here, Already, they didn't reach the Lachin Pass, but the Lachin Pass came into artillery range of uh, the Azeri forces. The Armenians threw in the towel and uh, agreed to a very, very humiliating ceasefire. Um, let me explain, let me make clear that this was not a blitzkrieg. The whole distance, as I showed you, the advance westward in six weeks was about 100 kilometers, which is 65 miles and northward to, to uh, Shusha was about 50 miles. That was in seven weeks. So it was a grinding battle, mainly because the, apparently the Armenians fought very well. They gave, they fought for every inch, but they were overwhelmed. And why they were overwhelmed, we'll see that when we talk about the, the air war. But before we go to the air war, let's talk about missile warfare. Uh, interestingly enough, both sides had the precision missiles. The Armenians had the uh, Iskander SS-26, tactical ballistic missile, with a range of about seven, five to 700 kilometers. They used some of them very limitedly, allegedly against Azeri border towns in the north of Nagorno-Karabakh. One of them was so badly hit that the Israeli ambassador in uh, Baku, we have an ambassador there, went to, to pay his respect to that uh, city and uh, uh, share his uh, condolences uh, with, the, with the city fathers. Uh, the Azeris have uh, Israeli tactical ballistic missiles called LORA. They fired at least one of them, or maybe two, at a strategic bridge. You can see the picture here is from a, uh, the uh, smartphone of a traveler who goes with the road, and he managed to catch in one frame the Israeli LORA going down vertically exploding on that bridge. It didn't take the whole bridge down, it took half the bridge, but that was enough to uh, disrupt uh, communication on that uh, very very strategic bridge, which, which leads to the Lachin Pass. What's amazing here was how limited this uh, missile warfare, everybody was very afraid. The Azeris didn't hit Baku, and uh, uh, the Romanians didn't hit Baku, and the Azeris refrained from hitting um, Armenia's uh, Yerevan, or they have a nuclear uh, power station. And they threatened before the war, that there was a war, the Azeris threatened they'll uh, hit the nuclear reactor. They, they had the lower missiles at the range, but they didn't do it. So the uh, standing here is as how careful everyone was to hold back from using uh, ballistic missiles. The main show was the air war. And here to show you uh, the features of the air war first, the uh, vehicles themselves. I mentioned there were dozens of types of vehicles. Uh, the most prominent one, the Israeli Aeronautics Orbiter, uh, which is surveillance uh, aircraft. It takes off not from an uh, airfield, but from a catapult. There is the Turkish Bayraktar with its four uh, uh, gliding bombs, which was very, very prominent, and they work together. Here you see a scene of the Bayraktar hitting something. We'll see um, a video later once I down, but you see how the orbiter is sinking around doing battle damage assessment. 
And then there was the Israeli suicide, yeah, come to the suicide uh, UAV, the Harop, which is something invented by a devilish mind. I'll show you a video here how it works. So this UAV takes off like a rocket from a rocket launcher. And the rocket uh, ends, it turns on its lawnmower, propeller driven engine, and then it dives on the target, almost in 90 degrees, making this terrible rocket. Scream, I heard the scream. It's unnerving. I heard the scream of this uh, bird down. So uh, they, they, they bought a lot of them uh, from Israel. Uh, they started the war, the, whoever in, planned it for them, did plan brilliantly. They bought dozens of ancient uh, agricultural aircraft. This is a Soviet Antonov II. They converted them to remotely piloted aircraft and flew them above the battlefield, drawing Armenian anti-aircraft fire. And by that locating, the batteries and the weapons. Once they had that located, they started slaughtering the, uh, the Armenian air defense. Slaughtering is hardly a word for this. You see some examples in the videos here. Sorry about the music. You see that that was a, an air defense with, with a, a system. Look at that. The, the antenna is still rotating. It's rotating, but it doesn't see the UAV. It's blind and it's being destroyed. That's a Bayraktar with its glide bomb. The glide bomb will its, its again. They, they are not aware that being attacked. The troops sit there in the tanks are being destroyed with a tank. That's a Strela tank. Another Strela tank. And that, that was with the, with the Bayraktar. I just showed you some of the, the hours and hours of those uh, videos. Uh, the Harop, the Israeli Harop, uh, did the most strategic stuff. Here is a Harop destroying an S-300, one of the legendary, uh, this is the antenna. The Harop is now going down, diving at 90 degrees with a screech, like a screech, a devilish screech from hell. You see the team is hearing the screech and running away. Now the picture taking is stopped a few seconds before the hit, but it's hit. So it's in the middle of the of the site. So how that was three batteries, three three hundred S three hundred batteries inside Armenia, not in the Gorno Karabakh, were hit by the Israeli Harops and completely destroyed. Uh, and then once they had the air defense down, they started slaughtering the ground forces. And again, I'm saying slaughtering here is an understatement. Here is the Bayraktar. So you see a tank is stuck here. Another tank wants to go to its aid. It's, this is a, this is the site, gun site of Bayraktar. So it's within its gun site. Kaboom, it goes away. This one is knows it's under attack. He's trying to sneak away. No, no use. Here is a tank. You see the tank, the hatches are open because the crew is scared. They left the tank. It's, it's well defended, it's went again, but it's helpless against a weapon that comes from above. Look at that uh, gun, an artillery gun and a munition truck. The munition truck guard goes and it ignites the ready ammunition by the, by the gun. The gun is gone. So uh, again, I could spend hours here showing you more and more uh, videos. This is simply amazing. There was the guy um, called, uh, what's his name? Stein Milzer, I don't know where he, he He writes in a blog called Oryx, and he sifted all those videos one by one and counted how many pieces of equipment were destroyed by both sides, by the Azeris with the airborne system, the by Raktar and the uh, Harop, and by the and by the Armenians, with uh, basically mostly anti-tank uh, uh, missiles. So the main battle tanks, the Armenians lost counted, 185 tanks. 
that can shown in the video as being definitely destroyed by uh, air assets of the Azerbaijanis, while Azerbaijan lost 22 tanks to uh, uh, anti-tank missiles. Armored fighting vehicles, 89, 41. Guns, that they, they practically destroyed the whole artillery, the Armenian artillery. Multiple rocket launcher again. They shot them and they shot them. They, they, they hunted them almost to death. Trucks, it seems the Armenians lost this whole uh, military truck system. They, 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 was, they came to a standstill. Uh, air defense system, 20, no less than 26 air defense system, which didn't take any took perhaps took some managed to took some take some of the uh, Turkish UAVs uh, 14 radars and, and four UAVs uh, destroyed by other means but you can see here this is really slaughtered uh, numbers are, are t talking from themselves with such losses the Armenians simply couldn't couldn't continue the war they had to give up as I said a very humiliating ceasefire uh, this was a clear military decision. The Armenians, with all their bravado and their capability, they fought very well. There were almost no Armenian prisoners of war. They didn't give up. They fought to death, but it didn't help them with the disparity of equipment and the overwhelming technology the Azerbaijani displayed. And the end of the war, there is what's called Archach. What remained uh, is Nagorno-Karabakh as a doubtful, Political entity is not sure what where it belongs, but the Azeris don't go in. They they let them have some autonomy. All these other areas that were taken by the Azeri army during the war, or not taken but but left uh, vacant without Azeris, reverted back to Azerbaijan, became part and parcel of Azerbaijan, and all the uh, exiled Azeris who uh, who left in uh, 1991. Uh, were called to go back and repopulate uh, their cities there. Uh, in Armenia, there was a great humiliation. There was an attempt to uh, coup, to depose the Pashenian, but somehow he managed to hold on to power. So uh, the kids of Azerbaijan victory was air superiority, obviously. Uh, although they fought very bravely also on the ground, uh, the Azeris fought uh, with some capability. But uh, air, war, air won the war, and this is not surprising. We know it from, from, from the Second World War. He who wants to win the ground war must win the air war. But the surprise here was not that air won the war. The surprise was a groundbreaking innovation, was that air superiority was achieved and exploited by mainly by an unmanned aircraft and not by manned aircraft. This is the first in history. So this creates a lot of enthusiasm, and you could find tons of articles by military analysts saying it's a new, new era, a new generation, a revolution in military warfare. I say yes, but qualified. There are three caveats here. First, the weather. The Azeris chose the time of the year very wisely. Uh, October is a good time there. It's Indian summer. Uh, it's not too hot. It's not too cold yet. It's not snowing. No, no, no clouds in the sky. So it was a very favorable. When weather closed in, in the last week of the war, our UAV operation was practically suspended. But by that time, the Armenians were beaten. Uh, one of the main countermeasures against UAV, UAVs are helpless against manned aircraft. If you put them in the gun sight of a fighter aircraft, they are dead. And they are, they are very easy to acquire. The, the UAVs are not that small, they are big. They can be acquired at uh, a buyer Qatar as a wingspan of an F-16. So it cannot hide in the sky. But for some reason, the Armenians didn't use their, uh, their, their uh, assets, not even the old Soviet era uh, fighter that they had. And uh, last but not least, there was absence of counter UAV electronic weapons. Now, UAVs are not men. Instead, they are in communication with GPS, uh, with other satellites, with a ground station, and with various other concepts that they depend on this communication line. If you disrupt the communication line, the UV becomes helpless. It gets lost. Usually it has uh, some go home uh, uh, algorithm, same turn around and go home. And uh, But uh, many times it just uh, crashes down. It, it goes down, it, it, it's helpless. Why? Uh, 
there was an absence of fuel electronic warfare, while the Russians had two excellent systems, uh, uh, anti, anti UAV uh, electronic warfare. The Armenians owned one of these uh, units called the uh, repellent. This is marketing name the Russian give them repellent. And uh, according to Armenian spirit Pashinyan, the, the system didn't work. It didn't specify, it didn't elaborate why it didn't work. But according to a Russian uh, media source, it was, didn't work because it was destroyed by Nazari UV to add insult to injury. But the Russian themselves, you know, the, I, I told you there are two bases in Northern Armenia. They have the much more capable Krasucha. This is a much more powerful system. And they're using a Krasucha in Syria to fend off and neutralize uh, UAVs that from time to time are uh, sent to uh, have them from people who are not happy of Russian uh, uh, presence in Syria. Uh, the Russian uh, reported that the unit, one of the units in Armenia downed several Turkish by Raktars. But since the system was deployed about 250 kilometers north of the battle area, it's not clear what the Bayraktar was doing there. So, so, so maybe there was, was something, to, so many Russian made ground based ground defense systems were destroyed one after the other. So I think they, they were insulted in order to uh, save the national dignity. Uh, they came up with the story that they uh, destroyed some of them. So this war, as I said, was a short war, but very illustrative about the future with all these caveats. And everybody and his brother learned this war, military, our military. I, I, I published on that, so our military came to inquire me about what I think about what happened in the war, just show you how seriously we took it. Before I continue about the lessons we learned here, I want to distinct, make a distinction in the nomenclature. Uh, these uh, terms, UAVs and drones, are used uh, intermixedly. Uh, the, the, the media usually call everything which is pilotless without a man inside called it a drone. To be precise, what we do, we call unmanned air vehicles, those small aircraft, sometimes they're big aircraft, that take off, un they are unmanned, but they take off from runways, or they're small enough to take you off know, from a ca catapult. It could be a rubber catapult, an air compressed catapult, a pyrotechnic catapult. And this is the orbiter, you can see it's taking off from a catapult. Then there is a drone, which is a thing, the toy that you buy for your children in Amazon. And um, uh, you can use it for taking beautiful pictures. And the military use bigger versions of them to drop uh, loads and bombs. So let's distinguish here between UAV and drones. Well, the Israeli military learned from that and it showed in an excellent exercise it made just two weeks before the last uh, two months before the last outburst with the Palestinians in Gaza. This is an exercise showing enhanced firepower and anti uav capability of iron gun. You see here we simulate, this is Israeli Katusha simulating the enhanced firepower that they expected from the Palestinians. We were expecting from the Palestinians. Ah, this, this is a marketing version. What do you see them being destroyed? This is the rockets. Now come the UAVs. Target UAVs are launched. An Iron Dome, Iron Dome, the same Iron Dome that has the algorithm to deal with the uh, UAVs, with low flying UAVs. We are seeing four UAVs in formation. One, two, three, four. All gone. So we were preparing for that. And then in May came the, and then another thing we were preparing is uh, soft defense. I talked about UAVs being very sensitive to disruption and especially drones. So we have a new system, Rafael Drone Dome, which is consists of several radars looking for the UAVs and an electronic disruption system. Uh, this particular unit belongs to the Royal Army. We sold four systems to them to, the UK and you, you Marines are also using 
uh, this system. Um, Operation Guardian of the World started the uh, scuffle with the Palestinians on May 10th evening. And in my more detailed uh, presentation, I'll go in some length at the roots and the processes uh, that escalated this series of escalation that brought to this uh, event. Uh, they fired all, all together about 4,360 4, within 10 days uh, of rockets and mortar bombs. Of which, and this is interesting, only 3,575 crossed the Gaza border. It's only 82% because they had a reliability problem. Those are self-made rockets. They are not smuggling in any, 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 any rockets anymore. They are making them in situ. And they have some bugs still in the production process. But you can see the rate of fire. This is where the main places at the attack. The main city was uh, Ashkelon. They really tried to pulverize the city. Not very successfully. Tel Aviv was attacked two or three times. Uh, they fired a very long range almost all the way to Eilat, and they attacked some settlements near Shechem. Uh, and at this uh, intensity of the fire, you can see here, this is uh, a smartphone video by Hamas, uh, some Gaza, Gaza, in Gaza. Look at this intensity of fire. And this one is scary. They managed to fire 135 rockets within five minutes. So we have to talk with that. Um, the rate, the rate of fire was the most intensive ever in any conflict that we had them, including the Hezbollah in the Second Lebanon War. Uh, Richard the Times, one day there was 500 rockets per day. However, uh, all other attempts to use ground raids and uh, maritime raids uh, through the sea were foiled. Uh, we will manage to um, destroy one of the underwater uh, vehicles. I, I want, uh, again, in a more detailed presentation, I'll go into that in some more detail. But let's stay here with our preparations, that lesson learned from the Nagorno-Karabakh war, from the previous war. First, Iron Dome. Iron Dome was upgraded, significantly upgraded. It's not the same Iron Dome as 2014. It was advanced both technically and main thing logistically. When they, you have to have, when you are under intense fire, you have to have ready launchers all the time, every time ready at your, at your uh, defense points. So you see the arrangements were made for quick logistics uh, at, the, at the firing sites. Uh, and you can see the rate of fire at Iron Dome, it's a cascade of fire. We are firing as fast as the Palestinians are firing their rockets. Uh, there is a short, uh, if, uh, this is taken a smartphone in Tel Aviv. And you see the stream of Iron Domes. There is a keep, keep out attitude, they keep out the uh, Intercepting the incoming salvo. This is a huge salvo. Uh, this is the most iconical uh, picture. Some, some guy in the occupied territories in Samaria went up to a mountain and took a time lapse picture of an attack on Tel Aviv on the 16th of May in the morning. You can see the rockets the plumes of the jet of the rockets attacking and, and the tactic was not to attack, not to concentrate on one city, but spread the fire on all the cities so the batteries, the Iron Dome batteries, cannot support each other. Each one has to defend its own area and it cannot uh, uh, give up some assets to defend the neighboring area. So all the towns from Ashkelon, <clears throat> Ashdod, Tel Aviv, the north of Tel Aviv were attacked simultaneously. And you see the Iron Domes uh, doing their thing. One battery here was not uh, uh, engaged, so it's sending some support to defend uh, this area here. Uh, in that particular uh, attack, there was no registered casualties and no damage. Iron Dome gave 100% uh, performance that night. It was, it was amazing. Everybody next day was 
simply amazed by that, that amazing performance. Uh, and now going back to Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, suicide uh, UAVs. Um, Hamas tried to surprise us with uh, a suicide UAV, which it never revealed before. It, it unveiled it during the war itself. I'll show you their video. This is not UAV that using a similar one to that in Yemen and in Lebanon. Launched from a simple climatic launcher. It's a suicide UAV. You plan a target uh, inside the small brain. It's a GPS guide, a GPS and GLONASS. It's called Shahab. That's it. Yeah, they, they, they pinned a lot of hope in that because you know how uh, the UAV is also red in the Gorno Karabakh war. And uh, they pinned a lot of hope into that. But uh, they were shot down. It was simply shot down. One of them was fired at the uh, Tamar, Tamar Gazrig in the Mediterranean. And its end in, is here. It was shot down by a fighter attack. As I said, UAVs are helpless against fighter attacks. And here is uh, the missile that took it uh, off. And the rest of them were shot down by Iron Dome. You can see the debris here. So um, Iron Dome did all the job. Was defending against the rockets and against uh, the UAVs. Lessons learned from Nagorno-Karabakh war. You need good air defense. Also, uh, if you remember, we talked about the uh, UAV attacks of uh, Iranian UAV attacks against the uh, oil installation in Saudi Arabia. The matter is detection. Uh, Gaza Strip is uh, small. It's covered completely by Israeli sensors from above, from the side, from below. They cannot fly UAVs without us finding them. And when you find them, you shoot them down. Same thing happened with the uh, drones. The Hamas sent several drones to try to um, hit our uh, some facilities. All of them were neutralized by uh, drone drone, by soft, soft defense. We had the soft defense deployed and it worked for the first time operationally. So the second, uh, to conclude, the second nagorno Karabakh war demonstrated that UAVs are as potent as uh, rockets and missiles in, in, in winning wars. Uh, but uh, with adequate early warning, uh, both UAVs and drones can be destroyed or neutralized. All three types of responses, either by manned aircraft, by missile defense, and by electronic warfare, were used successfully in by Israel as the guardian of the wall. And the Armenians failed to prepare for a UAV campaign, and because of that, they lost the war. That's uh, my conclusion from that. And at that point, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you, Uzi. Um I have a, a series of questions. Um, have you thought about how non-state, well, non-state actors uh, like Ham Hamas and Hezbollah, what lessons do you think they will take from both wars? Both the one in with Armenia, but also the launching of the what, over, you know, almost rockets and missiles at, at Israel. They will try to, they, they'll go the same way. They'll try to upgrade their capability with more firepower and uh, heavier warheads. They used heavier warheads this time because they figured that 10% uh, of, only 10% of their uh, rockets will uh, go through. So they wanted the 10% rockets uh, to be more lethal. And when I show you the detailed presentation, you see that it worked. Although we managed to shoot down 90% of them, the 10% that went through caused relatively more damage and casualties than in previous uh, campaigns. So they'll try to do it, but they have limits. The problem is that uh, when they make the rockets bigger, they can't hide them underground. They, they have to take them to launcher above ground. And those launchers can be found. This In, in this uh, round, our chief of staff said that we managed to destroy 70 multi-barrel launchers. Because it's, it's not that easy to hide, like uh, in the, the other ground silo. So, so they have limitations. They have limitations of uh, sizes of uh, of pipes they can use. They're using commercial pipes that we imported from Israel. Uh, they need explosives, so they found a sunken ship from the First World War, 
and they very proudly showed how they uh, salvaged the, the, the shells, the artillery shells, uh, to extract the explosive from them. But, but it's, it's, a, it's a limited source, the source. After a while, it ends. So uh, they, they have some limits there, and uh, I don't know if they reach their limitations. Uh, probably not, but I don't think they are very far away from uh, reaching the limitations. Can you, uh, one question we had is, to what degree did you, was the Israeli Air Force successful in getting rid of the ground launching uh, sites? You mentioned there was very successful, but is there a kind of a percentage which were above ground that you could get versus otherwise? I, I have no information of that. The only information that I have is uh, what's published that uh, Air Force managed to uh, destroy 70 over, overland launchers. What happened to the uh, missiles and rockets that didn't get out of the Gaza Strip? Did they fall back down on Gaza? and it fell down in our estimation that at least 20 Gazans were killed by them. By their own missiles? Yes. yes. Wow. How oh, interesting. Um, what do you think the Iranians learned from these two wars? Because they have been the suppliers of rockets and missiles to Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis. And what I found interesting is your comment that most of the Hamas rockets were self-made. Are they getting better at it, or are they not they are, able to smuggle it? They are getting better at it, although they are reaching a limitation. Uh, the, I think the Iranians are very pleased because the Iranians' strategy is not to try to destroy Israel in one's whoop. They have the 25-year plan to wear Israel down. So here is another round to wear Israel down. Um, whether it was effective or not, it was effective enough to unnerve Israelis, to cause damage to the economy. And uh, I think they are very pleased with it. It's a waypoint. It's not, it's not an end of the process. It's a process that the Iranians are energizing uh, but, uh, of course, we also learn from that, and we improve from uh, round to round. A question came from a couple of the uh, uh, people that are watching today. Is your, uh, are your slides available for distribution? Only if I know who uh, will accept them and no further use except personal use. Okay. And well. I'll do it as usual by name. You tell me who wants it, why, and I'll give permission to... Uh, Okay, we'll we'll work on we'll work on that Uzi to make sure that's uh, uh, taken care of. Um, what one of the question came in here from uh, a listener is there a concern that an enemy can overwhelm your missile defense batteries? I'm, I'm impressed by what Iron Dome did, given the criticism that initially came up, but. Is there an issue here of whether you're capable to detect and destroy incoming missiles? What if they try to overwhelm your batteries? Well, we'll try to improve our batteries and our firepower to the extent that they won't be able to overwhelm it. Uh, look, what they tried to do was to overwhelm. They worked hard for six years since uh, 2014. And we worked hard for 2014. And we remained, uh, I think, one half step way ahead of them. What do you think the Turks uh, learned from the conflicts? From the nagorno karabakh conflict? And, and, and the Hamas-Israeli? Uh, the Hamas, uh, it doesn't apply to them. Okay. Uh, it really doesn't apply to them. Uh, from nagorno karabakh they're very pleased. I mean, the, uh, <laughs> Erdogan was present in the victory parade in Baku, which was very impressive. Uh, he didn't show much uh, joy to see the Israeli systems uh, parading there, but he was uh, beyond himself with joy to see the Turkish uh, troops taking part in it and the Turkish weapons being uh, paraded by. Um, I think it's part of his uh, trying to set up a perimeter of a zone of influence, a Turkish zone of influence, which will distinct and put back the Russian part of this. Basically, it's, it's not a confrontation, but it's kind of a competition between, between Turkey and Russia. 
Um, so the significance was not so military, but uh, strategic. I have a question from a, a mutual friend of ours, Charles Perkins. Let me read it to you, Uzi. He says, there's been much discussion of drone U of A swarms or networked autonomous platforms enabled by artificial intelligence. How significant is this trend and can missile defenses adapt to such maneuvering targets? Well, with drones, uh, if you're talking about drones or UAVs, they cannot maneuver that much. Uh, Iron Dome is a very agile missile and no matter how much it uh, maneuver, an air vehicle like that, like a, like a drone, a quadcopter, or uh, even an uh, aircraft, a real aircraft like a UAV, they, they, they cannot maneuver out of the way of, uh, of an Iron Dome. Iron Dome basically is an anti-aircraft missile adapted to become anti-missile missile. So uh, there's no way coming. They can swarm up, gang up, it, it won't help them. About this whole idea of swarming, there was one, uh, I was asked by someone a couple of days ago to react to a, an article about Israeli swarms above Gaza that are uh, ostensibly using artificial intelligence in order to uh, pick a target and shoot it automatically without command from the ground. I say that's a uh, nice science fiction. It doesn't work with the military. No military will allow a system to shoot without getting permission from a human operator, preferably an officer who will get the permission all the way from above. So all these things are very nice figments of imagination and technically feasible, but I don't think it operationally makes any, any sense. I don't know about any Israeli swarm that can, uh, or allowed to, to who take out targets automatically. Uh, a question came from uh, another mutual colleague, uh, colleague of ours, Marvin Foyer of APEC. And his question is the cost of Iron Dome versus the cost of the incoming missiles and rockets is of course greater. And it's often been said of missile defense critics that if the defense is more expensive than the offense, the offense will win. What kind of lessons did you learn here? and? To what extent do you think lasers can either substitute for Iron Dorm or Dome or complement the system? It's a good question, which I intended to speak in my more detailed uh, <clears throat> presentation, but let me say that the consensus is here that lasers will become effective, but will never replace uh, interceptor weapons because of two inherent limitations. First, weather, that's act of God. We cannot overcome it. And second, the latency. Uh, a laser takes time to kill a target. It doesn't work in parallel. Iron domes, each iron dome, when it goes out of the launcher, is already paired with the target. And it's not dependent what the other iron dome does. With the lasers, you have to wait for the laser to shoot the target, and, and only then you can turn to the other target. So the slow rate of fire. So these are basically it can be overcome. Again, I don't want to go into details. I'll answer that more fully in my more full presentation on the war. Uh, but uh, with all the improvements that can be done, the consensus now is that uh, laser weapons can help reduce the price of defense, but not replace uh, interceptor weapons. To what extent did Israel uh, also defend itself from the north because I think some worries were that Hezbollah would join the fight, so to speak, uh, with their uh, Hamas allies. Well, I don't know. It's a particular situation. I don't want to uh, lie about that. I know that it's uppermost in the, uh, in the minds of our uh, decision makers. Right. And uh, it's a complicated question. I don't have a simple answer for that. Well, on behalf of the uh, Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies and myself, Uzi, it is always um, very, very informative to listen to your presentation. I'm particularly interested in the lessons learned, uh, both by the Turks and the uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, but also Israel. And I wanna thank you for taking the time to do that uh, and speak to us. I will try and work to see whether we can also uh, find a way to get your presentation that you're doing uh, when you translate it into English and finish it to get it also presented. And yes, 
uh, next year in Washington, D.C. Uh, we will see you in person, and uh, we look forward to that. Let's open play. Let's yes. play. Let's give Pfizer a hand uh, for the uh, yes. So, um, <laughs> nations. So on the behalf of against the Delta variant. So on behalf of the Mitchell Institute, thank you, Uzi, for joining us, and for all of you folks out there who came to talk, uh, uh, visit with us. Thank you very much for your remarks, uh, for your comments, your questions, and we will see you again at our next uh, session. And Uzi, again, on my behalf and behalf of Mitchell. Thank you very much for your wonderful. You're most welcome. I enjoyed every minute as usual, Peter. Under you, and it's always a pleasure to speak. Thank you, sir. Take care.